All right, guys, joining us on the show right now, he is director of a really cool horror film that I got to check out when we were up in Sacramento for Sacramento Horror Film Fest. Um, <clears throat> it was the one feature-length film that they showed, and I thought it was definitely deserving of the time that it got because this film, Red Snow, takes you in multiple different directions, has you on your toes the whole time. And uh, it is a lot, a lot of fun, the entire, the entire film to uh, to watch. So I'm stoked to have the director of that film, Red Snow, Sean Nichols Lynch, on our show. How are you doing today, man? Great, and thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, it's uh, I'm I'm really happy that people are are digging the movie. This thing like immediately gives off. 30 days and nights vibe like right from the get-go 30 days and night i'm like damn okay so they're going right down the middle uh you know winter town vampire and then like five minutes in damn does it take a turn and then 20 minutes in, it takes another turn and then we turn again like so this the humor aspect of the film reminds me a lot of like the sense of humor that our crew has so i have to imagine with like jokes like candy elves and uh, <laughs> the, the different shit that they do like while there is some scary stuff going on you guys probably had like a blast filming this thing i imagine oh yeah it was it was definitely like it was it was like definitely like a a tight shoot you know there were there were probably like 10 or 11 people on the crew total uh we were yeah. split between a few different cabins including the cabin we were shooting in a lot, bunch of us were, were bunking in the cabin <laughs> like sleeping on the hot set yeah, uh, sure. yeah yeah it was a really tight-knit uh group and um it helps to be making the kind of movie that you yourself would like go out and see you know like part of the reason that i wanted to make a movie like this was because I'm a fan of vampire movies and a fan of holiday horror, like Christmas horror, you know, like Black Christmas, Krampus, sure. um, all of those things. And and I'd never really seen them married together. You know, I mean, you mentioned 30 Days of Night, which of course is awesome, but it's like, I think of that as more like a winter vampire film and it's yeah, not for like sure. necessarily Definitely. like a Christmas movie. Right, right. Like, uh, so, you know, I just, I, I really wanted to go out and make the kind of movie that I would want to go see, you know, and, uh, and that was part of just the joy of, of making it. Yeah. The fact that uh, you just pointed that out now that I agree with you on the whole third days and nights, not a Christmas movie. Um, but uh, I've never seen that pops into mind a Christmas vampire movie before. So and that really, the fact that it's Christmas is definitely uh, prevalent in the movie, in your movie. But you, I, when I was watching it, I was so wrapped up in your your hero's journey relationship with the the vampire that the whole Christmas aspect really didn't even like like oh yeah it's 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 Christmas. Because she visits that when she's talking to her sister at the top. And then it kind of doesn't really like, could, understandably, so without giving away spoilers too much. But she has a lot of shit happen to her. To where Christmas <laughs> is understandably on in the back of her mind. But then you kind of bring it back into the scene when they're they're watching uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Is, is that the movie that they're watching? They're watching um, Scrooge. It's oh, like Scrooge. Uh, it's like an That's old right. Christmas Carol adaptation. It, um, and the only reason I know that is because we could only use like movies that were in the public domain <laughs> because sure. of the oh, yeah. the budget on this thing. So they, whenever they're watching something, it's like Nosferatu, uh, like the yeah. 1930s Scrooge. Like they have like very old fashioned taste in this movie uh, because it's uh, it's a pretty low budget flick. Um, the. Uh... The, the public domain use is very much we just screened Nosferatu on our uh, like server for everyone just to like do like an online gathering and the public domain thing. Yeah, that's totally a solid call with the Christmas Carol uh, public domain. 
Uh, yeah, I, Nosferatu holds up pretty well for being like a hundred years old. Like, <laughs> totally, his makeup is still yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, the uh, fact that you guys were able to stay on set, whenever I hear that, it makes me think you guys filmed this thing in a real like regimented amount of time. How long did you take to film this thing? Well, um, we had to move pretty fast because, uh, you know, it's the, the more days you spend, the more expensive it becomes. We did, uh, I think we did about three weeks in Tahoe and then we did a pickup day later for like, there's a scene that happens at a bookstore that we did after right. the fact. Um, and all of it was like right before COVID, like the timing of it was, couldn't have been better. Um, but I think the thing, the big thing that helped us was I went through everything with my cinematographer, Gavin Murray. Like we basically shot listed every single scene. Like we um, we did like a kind of visit months before we were even shooting where we kind of like did floor plans and like we really like were prepared going in and also just being prepared to adapt, you know, because if, especially on the night where we are doing a lot of the big like gore gags out in the woods, you know, with like heads getting ripped off and stuff, you have to, there's like the list of shots that you you would like to have. And then there's the shots uh, because I was editing the movie too, like the shots that I knew I absolutely needed to make this sure. work. And, sure. you know, I definitely got some of my would like to have, like I definitely got some of the things on my wish list, but there's also like, you know, oh, and it's like three o'clock in the morning. Like, <laughs> right, we can't, right. you know, we're going to have to let people go. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I think the, the preparation is what helped yeah, uh, shoot this pretty quickly and efficiently. It's it's kind of rad to hear you describe that because we, I just graduated film school, but before that, like the stuff that we were making before I went to proper film school, like we had no real idea what we were doing necessarily, like in retrospect. But that whole thing I th that you just talked about right now, I think is really crucial to uh indie film production no matter what the genre and that is the whole pre-production aspect because you're already doing more with less anyway in an independent film i think that is one thing that you can never be prepared enough on an independent budget and uh it, it's cool to hear you kind of instill my own kind of philosophy when we're trying to make something like I'm not like crazy. This is how most independent people are trying to get their stuff out there. Oh, definitely. And, you know, I think a good way to think about it is once you're on set, like time and money is just burning. And it's like For you sure. have think about all the time you have before you're on set is just like, OK, I can take my time and really like think this stuff through. You know, you can you can rehearse your actors. You can talk through all of the effects, uh, you know, um, in the case of this movie, we, we don't have a ton of like big effects work, like, uh, but the moments that are there, we really wanted to be big and spectacular and memorable. And so I worked really hard with my makeup effects person, Melanie, who did all the vampire effects and all the gore effects. She didn't have a team or anything. That was just Melanie. Mm -hmm. And we talked through like, okay, uh, you know, we have this like head ripping. What's, what is going to be in the frame? Like, how can we maximize this? Who is going to like have, uh, you know, all the 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 sit for the actual mold of the head? Like we had to get an actor who'd be willing to do that. My producer, Ulrich, ended up playing the poor schmuck who gets decapitated because oh, he was man. willing to sit for that mold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was really he really took one for the team there. Um, like just to have that stuff on him for however the, many hours to get the mold made but yeah that's like such a great that's such a great scene too like yeah and cool. and again it's just because we were prepared and you know we, we weren't flying by the seat of our pants once we were out on location because then it's a lot scarier like when you're actually on the clock that scene in particular really kind of turns the gore page for the movie too because up until that point there's been like little stuff but nothing at all at that level and it's almost like uh when he looks at her and it's uh, permission is not the right word but it's almost like this like affirmation that yeah i am like this brutal killing machine 
and I am exactly who you want me to be. Uh, her being the, the the real alpha of the vampire group. Um, but uh, when he bites him and then yeah rips his head off, I was like, damn, they're going full full evil dead for this. This was that whole process of getting to to film in that environment. Like, how was that? Because there's people who I have come who have come on the show and have done uh, either uh, short or feature that takes place around the holiday season, and they always get a kick out of living in uh, you know L.A. and they can film it in July and make it look like it's 30 degrees outside or what have you, but Lake Tahoe only has snow for a certain amount of, of times. And this sure looked like Lake Tahoe that you're actually filming this in. Um, was it Tahoe and what was it actually Christmas time? Uh, it was Tahoe. It wasn't Christmas time. Um, we, uh, I intentionally shot this kind of early in the year uh, when a lot of like the best people are kind of between jobs, you know, like January, yeah. February, March is notoriously kind of a dead time. Right. I mean, it's starting to pick up by March, but we shot, uh, it was mostly in February of 2020 that we shot this. And, um, and part of that was also the weather. Like I wanted snow, but not too much that we wouldn't be able to get around and move from location to location pretty easily because most of it is in the cabin, but there's quite a bit of exterior work and there's quite a, there's some different locations that we go to throughout the movie. And, uh, you know, you can never guess what the weather is going to be like, like that could have backfired. We could have gotten there and all the snow has melted, you know, sure. but, uh, it ended up working out just fine. Yeah. The, the scenery like really, did it you know it stayed consistent for you throughout the entire time um because i can only imagine you get that thing half filmed and then all the snow melts or something like oh yeah you gotta wait now like hope that it snows again type of a thing um but yeah none of that like uh, ever came across like it was different times it's all super you know looks exactly how it should which is awesome your uh for lack of a better term, Van Helsing figure, um, he he was a rad character. Like from the good, the good side of him to the uh, the you bride of Satan, like you tell me, like all of that stuff, like the whole your whole little meta universe. Like I'm like, damn, they could still go back. He could go back if he wanted to and make. It fucking candy elf movie and all the other like stuff that this society you know is, has probably known it just reminded me so much of the uh the godzilla thing i'm like damn he's got like all these things he could do if he wanted to but that whole backstory and everything like talk a little bit about like where all that kind of came from because he was great yeah, uh, you know, it was sort of uh, sorry if, if my dog is barking in the oh, background. He's he's in he's he's recording with me here. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I I wanted to definitely have a little bit of world building in there, like have hints of other things going on. Like we we hear about this Severon group, but we don't get like a whole lot of time in it. And you know, those are just kind of like crumbs. Like if I ever did another one, I of course would want to investigate further. But I I was all about like I we got to keep things moving. We don't want to get too bogged down in exposition and stuff. Like we just have some idea that there's this like shadowy network of vampire hunters out there, or maybe they hunt more than vampires. Like it's never yeah. confirmed what all is real. Uh, we kind of skirt that issue in this one. But yeah, uh, you know, uh, Vernon Wells plays uh, Julius King. He was, uh, I knew him best from Commando, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. He plays Bennett, yeah. the main villain in that. And he's also Wes in The Road Warrior. Like he's done a million things and, uh, we were really lucky to get him. And that's, uh, you know, that was a crazy, like, coincidence that I knew somebody who knew him, uh, uh, Brian Martin, who's another who's a local filmmaker uh, in the Sacramento area. He knew him and was able to get him on board. Like, he, uh, and it was crazy. Like, we didn't get any rehearsal time with him or anything. He just kind of showed up, you know, mm -hmm. and he was just ready to work. Like, he's just an old pro in that way. Um, and, yeah, he nailed it. He's He's... Not in the movie a whole lot. He's mostly in the the first half there, but uh, but yeah, he was a lot of fun to work with, and 
you know, it always helps a little movie like this to have like at least one recognizable face. You know, they don't have to be a yeah. huge celebrity or anything, but I think it, it definitely helps. You know, when when people hear that you've got a movie, they say, "Oh, well, who's in it?" And I can say like the bad guy from Commandos in it, <laughs> and yeah. that's just like a jumping off spot for like people to get kind of excited about it. You know, that's funny that you say that. One of my friends has always joked, and I mean, you you politely say recognizable face. He he uh, would say like you just need like a a, a D list celebrity. Like if you can get a C list celebrity, holy shit, a D list. That's all personal perspective, but it's the same. It's the same. Uh, the same thought process is if you can get one person to open up that conversation you just mentioned. I think that is kind of it's cool to to talk to you having just done it because in my eye, like right now, the next film we've done this short, which is how we I cross paths with your film. Then the next, the next one on the docket is like, okay, now we're going to try to make a 35 to 40 minute thing and then eventually break into the, the feature length thing. And after the feature length thing, then it is to get that one recognizable guy for your next picture. And then it's like, holy shit, like now this opens up to more and more. Like, so the evolution of the craft, it is real. And I'm, I'm just, talking to to sean but i'm really talking to anybody listening to the podcast or watching this it's like there are there are stepping stones so to speak that you go through in order to get better i just the 30 minute one i sent the script to the guy because coincidentally our next one is a is a uh, christmas themed one it's like an anthology like 10 three little 10 mini shorts but then it's the the glue is the narrator we got like the whole like, oh, welcome in. Like, I didn't hear you come in now. Oh, like, yeah, like the Crypt Keeper type character. Right, yeah. Right. And, uh, but the actor, Charlie, he's been around doing stuff with us since forever. And he's actually in the film that I made that made me go to film school. And he was like, dude, like, just so you know, so I made a comment to him, like, I don't understand how this ghost executioners is doing so good. Like, and he's like, you're your own worst critic, like enjoy the ride, shut up type response. But then when he read this script, he was like, just so you know, like you're noticeably getting better at how you're, you're writing this shit. And he's like obviously you've gotten to the point now where you've made a, a short that's doing good so now th this is the logical next step on paper this looks like it's going to be a lot of fun so it's like to hear that affirmation it's like okay do a few of those and then try to you know add 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 and then you you progress along and so that's really rad to to get to talk to you because you've now gotten to that point where you're your production company uh you're yourself filmmaker you're you're getting along in this red snow is your film that you got to have the one recognizable dude as your bad guy and he freaking brought it for you too he's fucking i mean i say yeah, he did not phone it in at all like he was <laughs> ready to go like despite us not rehearsing with him or anything he vernon really did a great job with that too like your cast that you guys ended up finding was really perfect for the roles in which they do like the chemistry between you know your two protagonists when he's giving them notes on on her you know uh memoir and it's like why like why is he living in transylvania have you ever been to transylvania like that part of europe fucking sucks because you know where all the real vampires are they're like someplace fun because like and like all that stuff like did you have is that all you or did you like have a group because to me it like that's like the conversations that we have when we're having beers and we're like just talking about what we're going to talk about for a podcast those are like those are the jokes that come like down the line of a conversation so to hear like him drop them like one-liners i'm like oh shit like this is a vampire i want to party with <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the casting was uh, was it was pretty interesting. It was unlike anything I've done before. Uh, 
because I really wrote it around uh, the, the leads were people that I already knew from, I went to film school at San Francisco state and I met them there. Denise. So basically Denise Cisneros, who plays Olivia, who, you know, you've seen the film, but she's like a struggling vampire romance novelist who yeah. was looking for her big break. And then Nico Bellamy plays the vampire that she has a chance encounter with. And they form this kind of, you know, tense relationship throughout the film. You know, a lot of that was just, I I knew that Denise could bring it and I definitely like brought it, I, I definitely like molded that character around her. So okay. um, the dialogue was all pretty much what was on the page uh, from the script that I wrote. But I think there's something to be said for the actors sort of bringing their own personality to it. Like there are definitely some line readings and some some of that comedic timing that honestly, what, what they did was better than what I had in my head when I wrote it. You know, I think just finding those right people. And then the rest of the cast were just, uh, aside from those two and Vernon, were just cast in the Bay Area, like at an open casting call. That's where I found Laura Kennan, to, who plays Jackie, kind of the main villain, like the alpha vampire you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. And uh, Alan Silva is a stunt guy who plays Brock, the other um huh. Yeah, and so, uh, but I was interested in him, in him not as a as a stunt guy, but as an actor. Um, and I think that that was he was really drawn to because you know he he actually got to sort of play a character. I mean, he's not as yeah. developed as as the other vampires, but you know he's definitely got that kind of like henchman quality that like a, almost like a sure. James Bond henchman or something. Um, and that really appealed to him. So you know, it's like a real mix. It was like the my two buddies are the two leads, and then these two like sort of up and coming people uh, as the villains. And then, you know, we got our, our kind of uh, veteran actor as, as the, as the vampire hunter. So it was kind of just like an interesting mix of people. And it was fortunate that we all just got along really well. And, and everyone kind of understood the tone of the piece that we were, you know, that the comedy would come from the characters and the, like the dialogue, but, the horror we had played treat pretty seriously. Like when vampires are ripping people apart like that, we play pretty straight. Uh, yeah. and, and they were all kind of on board with that. And also, I mean, he brought out for enough of a character where you, you could tell that he struggled with that decision because he did, he was digging Olivia. Olivia wants him to drink pig's blood for the rest of her life. Because she wants to, she wants him to be the the saved vampire, the good, the the vampire in her dream book, essentially. And uh, so you you cared enough about it to when he does rip the head off of that dude, you're like, ah, oh, damn, he's actually killing people for real. Like this yeah. is definitely not the first time he's done this, but yeah. At the same time, it's all practical effects and it all looks pretty fucking dope. So you're like, that's pretty rad. Like, and then the the brain goes to like how you talked about the mold making and everything else. Like, okay, how the hell did they actually do this? Um the biz like the the butcher shop that she gets his blood and uh the other like local streets and stuff that you kind of see them navigating around. Uh, is that all Tahoe as well? Uh, yeah, uh, it's all Tahoe. Um, the, the butcher shop scene, uh, we are lucky because there's pretty much only one major butcher shop in, in South Lake Tahoe, like that, that looked good and like what kind of fit the movie. It was Overland Meats. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a real business. You can go there. Uh, we talked to them about what we were doing. We were like, we don't really have, we can't really pay you or anything, but we'll give you a credit. And they were down with that. Like, they were just like, yeah, show up before we open. And like, yeah. it's a really quick scene and, you know, we didn't really bother them or anything. We didn't really disturb their business. Um, and yeah, and the guy who's in the movie, <laughs> it's just a guy who works there. And we like liked his looks awesome. or like, well, you put on a Santa hat and, and be in the movie and sign this image release. And he was down for that. Uh, yeah. So uh, um, yeah, it's all Tahoe except for the the bookstore scene we shot in in Berkeley. That's a uh, that's Sleepy hmm. Cat Books. Uh and that was the only bit that we shot during COVID. So that was that was a tricky thing to navigate. You know, um, we had to get like an onset uh, uh, COVID compliance officer and a medic and, and make sure we did it in a safe way. And, 
mm. make sure everyone was tested before. But you know, that's that was just uh, the last piece of the movie we needed was all the stuff in the bookstore. So once we got that done, we you know looked at it and it's like, oh, this is a movie. Like this is this is awesome. It all it cuts together. <laughs> Thank God. How big into COVID were we when when you guys shot it? Well, uh, it was crazy because um, we shot in February into early March of 2020. And while we are shooting, you know, we are getting news updates. Like the, the right, first right. time I ever heard of COVID-19 were like, you know, these, these push notifications on my phone. It's sure. like, well, you're shooting the opening sequence when I got the push notification that was like, uh, the new James Bond movie has been pushed back a year, or like pushed to November or whatever, because of and that was yeah. as a it's like a movie buff and a James Bond fan. That was the moment where I was like, "Oh shit, this is serious." If they're right. if they're pushing back a a Bond movie, uh, and so and like literally when we wrapped and when I got back, to, I was living in San Leandro at the time. When we when uh, I uh, my wife and I came back that's when the lockdown started happening. And that's mm -hmm. when it was it like the timing could not have been better. Like we literally got, you know, 90% of the movie, 90, 95% of the movie done, like right before the lockdowns happened. That's good. I mean, that definitely gives you something to do during the lockdown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect time for, for post. Um, is our, so this the three films we did the first one right around that time too and i can remember thinking um something similar to you my ours was when they announced they were going to close disney and i was like damn if disneyland is closing like this is this is actually really, really bad because that's the one yeah. place that's gonna stay open as long as possible is yeah Disney. And so yeah, that was like what shows you like you know, in the middle of just being trying to be an adult and everything else, like in retrospect, like damn, it took you until Disney to realize how bad it was, huh? <laughs> like, and now it's crazy how that that has changed us i know filming now it's like everybody goes down the line and uh, we do like the mask conversation like okay today we're filming in um a living room just to shoot one out there and so you are you know if you're helping out in this scene like you're gonna be within two feet of each other because we're all crammed in this one room. Steve, do you want masks or are you okay without masks? I'm okay without masks. Okay. Valerie, I'm okay without masks. Susan, I, I'm kind of wanting masks. The second that like one person says they want masks, everyone's wearing the mask. Like stop the survey right there. So I don't know how like with you seeing the difference of getting out ahead of it just for the little like, was there a pretty drastic kind of mentality when you went back to the bookshop in Berkeley with how you guys Oh, were totally. Doing yeah. Everything was different. You know, um, and, you know, part of the reason that I think uh, during the principal photography in Tahoe, I mean, we were just so buried in the making of the movie. Like every hour I was awake, I was working pretty much. And I just, uh, I think that, that that's part of the reason I was so unaware of it and in February, March of 2020. And so when we came back, I think it was September, that was much later that we shot uh, the um, yeah. the bookstore scene. And that was just one day of shooting, luckily. But yeah, we were very on it. I mean, um, the vaccine wasn't out yet, but you know, uh, we we hired a compliance officer we who like kept very strict rules. Like the only people who are unmasked were um, Denise and one other actor that she was interacting with, Edward. And uh, they both got negative tests right before um, and like between takes, you know, the masks and, and all that would go back on. And it's funny because the bookstore scene was actually supposed to be like a big day for extras, you know, like in our crowdfunding. One of the things was you get to be an extra in that scene. And I had to make some tough calls to be like, hey, we're just going to have crew wearing masks with their backs to the camera in line and just pump in and post like some crowd walla walla sound, you know, because we can't, there's just no way to do a crowd scene right now. 
But yeah. luckily, people are really understanding. And I was like, you know, think of this as a rain check for the next one. <laughs> like, uh, sure. I'll get you on the next one. But uh, yeah, you know, that's been and that's honestly been my only experience shooting in COVID was that one pickup day. Like since then, it's been entirely, you know, taking the movie on the festival circuit and post-production and all that kind of stuff. So eventually I'm going to have to get back onto the production side and uh, it's going to be a totally different landscape as you're well aware it sounds like did you make it to sac horror when it was there were you did you yeah yeah i did um yep. yeah yeah that was that was pretty cool um uh and and we're also playing um uh, i'm not sure when this is coming out but we're also playing uh another hole in the head in san francisco on december 9th and uh and yeah it is cool to go know. to the in-person events um it's so like we're, uh we're recording on a Friday. So this gets posted uh, Monday. So there you oh, go. Cool. So this Thursday. <laughs> yeah. If you're listening to this, just in a, a couple more days, hole in the head. Yeah. Uh, you guys are out there. Are you going to be out there checking it out live? Oh yeah. I'm going to be there. A bunch of the cast. It'll be there. Uh, yeah. It'll be a, like, it's, it's, we're pretty much like a Bay area production. Uh, most of the uh, cast and, and crew is they're kind of split between, like bear in Northern California and Southern California. And at least the Northern California contingent will be there in, in force. But yeah, Sacramento horror was awesome. I'd been there a couple of years earlier. My wife and I did a short film called audio book of the dead. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just a two minute short. Uh, would basically uh, my wife plays this woman who's driving home from work, listening to an audio book, and suddenly the narrator like turns evil on her. Uh, nice. And that was just like, a, that was just like for fun that we did that. And uh, yeah. so I was already well aware of Sacramento Horror Film Festival. And I definitely wanted to submit there, even though they tend to be more towards on the, towards short films. But luckily we sure. were the one feature programmed and, and we won best feature somehow, <laughs> which is cool. Yeah. It's like, I guess by default. <laughs> Yeah, no, I saw the 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 thing with the the belt. Uh, yeah, and the picture that they posted and everything. I was stoked. I was like, yeah, hell yeah. Um, uh, the whole festival circuit. Um, this really being our first one that has done a festival circuit. Uh, it's it's really cool. It's cool to go out there and um, meet fellow filmmakers, but it's cool to just like get essentially like you're getting a binge watch the way sack was essentially because it was like in these two hour chunks i was like oh it's like season one two and three we're just like sitting here binge watching a whole like slew of these like different short films and it was really cool because like the majority of them they were all um they were all unique like everybody had like a different take on it whether it was like funny scary psychological ghosts like everyone seemed like they were touching subgenres separate of each other and if there was like two ghost movies one was actually scary and one was funny like they were never like direct comparisons of each other which was pretty cool yeah, the the programming was great. Uh, I mean, and, and a good festival will do just that. They'll they'll pick things that are all different genres, all different production values. I mean, there were shorts that ha I know for a fact had a bigger budgets than my feature. <laughs> like you can just tell, like just enormous yeah. production value in this like ten minute short. And uh, and then there's ones that are very lo-fi and, and uh, or on the student level that are that are also great. And um, Having that, I think that that's the great thing about attending a, a festival like Sac Horror or some of these other places that we played is like you're getting kind of this curated like playlist of great horror from sometimes all over the world, uh, yeah. but certainly all around the country. And um, and it's fun to see familiar faces at different festivals. You know, some of these filmmakers I've run into a bunch of times, either feature filmmakers or short filmmakers. And, you know, it's just kind of part of the journey. And you know, we're kind of coming up on the end of our festival run. Uh, the movie's coming out on digital. In in Europe gets it December 6th, before oh, Christmas. Nice. For some reason, America is getting it after Christmas. And okay. I asked my distributor, like, why is that? Like, and they're like, oh, we don't want to compete with the other 
Christmas movies. I guess they're trying to like hide the fact yeah. that it's a Christmas movie, but I which I get that, you know, like I kind of get yeah. both perspectives. I think of it as a Christmas horror movie, but like you For said, sure. it's kind of more just like the, it's kind of just a flavor that's added, but, uh, but yeah, it's, um, so it's, it, we're enjoying these last few festivals. You know, we've been, we've been at it since April. Uh, we started at Panic Fest in Kansas City and we've gone to Portland Horror. We went to Fright Fest in London. I wasn't able to attend all of these, obviously, but um, right, right. Uh, Genre Blast in Virginia was a cool one at the Alamo Draft House. That was when I was actually able to attend and we won the right, audience right. award there, which is pretty awesome. And that's yeah, that's it's like great. this is like the best part of the filmmaking journey is like getting to tour with your movie. Cause like once <laughs> it's out, it's kind of like, here's the DVD, you know, it's like not as, it's right, not quite as right. fun, you know, you don't get to meet the filmmakers and all that good stuff. It's kind of, I don't know if you've begun um, like on stuff since then. I'm sure that you have since the film's been done. If you've, especially if you've been doing festivals that long, but the, uh, it's just kind of a trip to go back to something after it's been done that long. And then it begins its festival circuit. It was, it was so much so that when ours got in, my wife was like, this is, like she is my my boardroom executive like i pitched the ideas to her and so when it started to get in she her thing was um this is not your last thing that you were talking about this is like two and i was like yeah no this is like we did this you know a little over a uh, little under a year ago just because it's weird how you could do that with film like once one is done, it's done. You're on to the next one, but just kind of the way it always seems like it works, especially with film festivals, is it'll get into stuff, and you may have submitted it, you know, a ways back, but then the actual festival is, you know, six to nine months later. So it's almost like this like high school reunion you feel of like lets you remember all the the fun that you had while you were making that one, even though now you're on to the next thing. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, that, that's kind of the one of the crazy things is like, uh, you know, I always tell people if you're going to make a movie, make sure that it's a movie you love because you're going to need a lot of patience. It's going to be a long journey. You know, mm. I wrote this in like 2019, shot it in 2020, spent all of 2021 like on the festival circuit with it. And then 2022 is like, you know, promoting the the digital and DVD release. And it's like, it's a, it's a long, long road. And uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, like you said, it's, it feels like an old project to me, but to everyone else, it's brand new, you know? Right. So you, you have to always keep that perspective and, and, and treat it like it's this new thing, even though you've lived with it for years. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so, you know, with that, Red Snow, I guess the the right way to in your VOD uh, app of choice would be like Red Snow 2022. Then, if you're in the USA, to find your Red Snow, right? Uh, I think like December 28th, we're just squeaking into 2021. Okay. Um, yeah, if you go to RedSnowMovie.com, we'll have links up. Uh, as of this recording, um, you can pre-order the DVD. Uh, I know that the digital stuff, it'll be on like iTunes, Amazon, Vudu, all those places eventually. But for right now, they're just having pre-orders for the DVD. I'm not sure why, but yeah, we'll, we'll have all those links up or you can just search Red Snow. I know that there's another Red Snow out there. It's like a war movie, but ours yeah. will be pretty obvious because there'll be like a vampire on the cover. Right <laughs> so on. yeah. For sure, yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, I'm definitely, we will definitely, when it actually hits stores, we will, uh, share a link, um, to where you guys can find it because that, uh, if you are of the, of the digital minded and you don't want the physical copy anymore. Um, but yeah, I'm super stoked. How about, uh, is there something that we can look forward to from you and, uh, your team, towards the future that you guys may have stewing in the pot? Uh, you know, I'm writing something right now. Uh, I, I don't have like any heart set plans on it yet, but there's definitely something cooking. Uh, and I'm, right. I'm going to let everybody know about that when I can say more about it. 
So right. yeah, I'm always working on something, but right now it's it's all red snow. Red <laughs> it's like snow. all promoting yeah. the movie. It's all doing the festivals. But yeah, I'm I'm definitely I can tell you a little bit. Like it'll be like a it'll be another horror movie for sure. I think it'll be right more on. darker than this one, but still with a, a sense of humor and uh, you know, and I I hope to try and surpass what we did here. Like that's always the goal. That is definitely always trying to do a little bit better than the next one. I got used to uh, telling myself that because every time I say it out loud, someone around me says, duh, it should be. Because I guess as as an artist, as a filmmaker, your next one should always be a tiny, at least a bit better than the next one. So, uh, Sean, man, I thank you for coming on the show. We will definitely have to get you uh, back on at some point to just either talk more Red Snow or talk horror in general or whatever you guys are up to, we will would definitely have to do something in the uh, future. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a blast, and, and yeah, happy to come back. Right on, man. Cool.